Welcome to Cool Talk, and today we're going to talk about the ancient Aztecs. That when the Spaniards arrived in the Americas in the 16th century, the Aztecs were at their peak. And like Rome, they were both glorious, gory, and decadent. This was a people heavily influenced by the Mayans, the Olmecs, the Zapotecs, and the Toltecs. You'll recognize much of the Mayan culture in the Aztecs. A heavy dependence on astronomy, the mythological. And for the Aztecs, time was cyclical, not linear. When an Aztec couple got married, they were very young, about 13 or 14, and they would tie a cloth around their waist and then tie them together. This is where the term tie the knot comes from. Now, women could not join the military, but for the most part, they were equal to men. Aztec women would weave and sell cloth like merchants. Now, Aztec women were experts at weaving cloth. And as you can see from these pictures, they still are. Noble Aztecs wore cotton cloth and sandals. But the commoners had to wear cactus fiber clothes and be barefoot. There was limited slavery. The nobles would advise the kings. Uh, commoners had to pay a tax. Now, merchants could get rich on the trade routes by selling pottery and big feathers. But the only way to advance in your status was through the military. If you did 20 brave deeds, you joined the elite and you got to wear eagle feathers and jaguar pelts. Now, when a king conquered a city-state, more often than not, they would demand a tribute. They would leave a leader in charge and a military body there to safeguard things. They would uproot a whole town and move them to that city-state so that they could assure loyalty. There were many marriage alliances. The Aztecs conquered and extended their power for two reasons. To acquire wealth through tribute and to supply human sacrifices to the gods. The Aztecs practiced human sacrifice at a level never seen. Human sacrifice, self-mutilation, and according to some sources, even cannibalism. Small animals were sacrificed. People would be taken to the top of an altar on a pyramid. Six priests would hold that person down, tear out the heart, and throw the body down the steps. Women could be sacrificed. Some people would be flayed alive, and a priest would wear that person's skin. Some sources state that in 1487, at the inauguration of one temple, 84,000 war captives were sacrificed in four days. Now, this could be an exaggerated account, but we do know that entire cities such as Ostotipac and Alahuitzlan were sacrificed, the entire populations. Aztecs believed in the afterlife, and you would come back, but you didn't go to any heaven. If you died in battle, or in childbirth, you went to a heaven called Tonatiu Hichan. If you died drowning, you would go to a heaven called Tlalocan. If you died as a baby, you would go to Omeyocan. The Aztecs derived from the Mexica. The Mexica came from the north, from a place called Aztlan. Now, some say that Aztlan may have been a mythical place. If it existed, it came from further up north, as far as today's southern United States. This is a social structure. The emperor is on top, the nobles come next, and the nobles were called the people team. The working class was known as the mace hual team. Now, even if you lived in the city, every family had to have a garden plot to grow food. Maize, fruit, herbs, and medicines. Canals and aqueducts were built. Lakes had fish, shrimp, amphibians, insects, and insect eggs. Now, the Aztecs had very few domestic animals, only turkeys and dogs. The Chinampas. In the Valley of Mexico, in swamp areas and lakes, little islands were created. They were made of the mud below, and they were fed nutrients. They created these little farm islands called Chinampas. You go into the shallow water, take the bottom mud with plant matter and vegetation and mix. Two and a half acres of this little island would feed 20 people. 22,000 acres could feed up to 180,000 Aztecs. You plant and then you go from Chinampa to Chinampa via canoe. There were huge trade markets. In Tlatle Loco, 60,000 people would visit that trade market every day. You could use cacao beans as currency for small purchases. 
You could trade a rabbit for 30 beans or a turkey egg for three beans. If you wanted to make a large purchase, you used cloth. At the Great Pyramid of Titnoctitlan, there were two altars on top, one for the god Huitzilpochtil and one for Tlaloc. There were two calendars, one was solar, 365 days, the other one was a ritual calendar of 260 days. Both stones interlocked and turned. And every 52 years or so, they would uh, get together and line up on year one. When that happened, there was a ceremony. In the ceremony, a victim was sacrificed and pottery was broken. The original Mexica came fleeing from nomads, fierce nomads such as the Chichimecas. They settled by Lake Texcoco in the late 1200s. Legend has it that they settled on the island in the middle of Lake Texcoco because they saw an eagle perched on a cactus with a serpent in his claws. They took this as an omen. And you can see the same image on the Mexican flag today. The center of the rising Aztec Empire is this, Tecnotitlan, a city in the middle of a lake of what is today Mexico City, home for 20 million people. And if you're wondering, well, Mexico City is not in the middle of a lake. That's because the Spaniards drained the lake and now Mexico City has water issues. The king of a city-state was known as the Tlatuani, and the first Tlatuani of Tecnotitlan, its founder, was Acamapistri. He reigned for 20 years, had married many marriage alliances, and he improved the agriculture. His son, Huitzilhuitli, became the second Tlatoani at 16. He founded the royal council, and his son, Chimalpopoca, became king in 1417, separating the ecclesiastical and government offices. Chimalpopoca reached out to the city-state of Azcapotzalco and made an alliance with its Tlatoani, Tesosomoc. Now, Tesosomoc, as luck would have it, was also his grandfather. This is because of all these marriage alliances. You can see on these maps how Azcat Pozalco is so close to Tecnotitlan. As luck would have it, however, Grandpa Tesosomoc died, and his son became the new Tlatuani, Tayatzin. Are you following all this? Let's just say that Tlatoani Chimalpopoca and Tlatoani Tayarsin got along very well. They built many canals and aqueducts. However, what happened? One day, Tayarsin's half-brother, Maxtla, seizes the throne and exiles Tayarsin. So, Chimalpopoca leads his army to fight Maxtla and place his friend and uncle, Tayarsin, back on the throne. However, Tayarsin dies. And then later, Chimalpopoca is captured. He's put into a cage and he would later hang himself. And this is how Maxla became the governor Tlatoani of Azcapotzalco. The next Tlatoani of Tenochtitlan, East Coatel, decides to get rid of Maxla once and for all. So he reaches out to the city state of Texcoco and its leader, Neza Hualcoyotel. Together they went out and they defeated Maxtel once and for all. Then these two leaders reached out to the city-state of Tlacopan and between the three city-states they formed a triple alliance. This was the birth of the Aztec power, the dominant force that would become the empire. This triple alliance would go on many military campaigns and take over city-state over city-state. And worst of all, they burnt all those city-states' codices, their books, so they could rewrite their history and write their own myths. A little trivia about Nesa Cualcoyotel, the Tlatoani of Texcoco. He was also a poet. He opposed human sacrifice, and he had 110 children. 
The next Tatoani was Moctezuma I. Now, he built many pipelines to bring fresh water into the communities, but they were floods and frosts, followed by droughts and famine. Moctezuma believed that the gods were angry, and to appease them, he needed to give them blood, more human sacrifice. He fought the city-state of Oxoaca. He defeated them, took their families, strangled their Tlatuani at Tonal. He enslaved the family. The young girls were gathered up as concubines, sex slaves. He had about 10 harems. Now, Moctezuma began began what we call today the Flower Wars, where he would go out against city-states with several small battles that would wear them down little by little. Entire villages were sacrificed to the gods. It was during Moctezuma I's reign that 84,000 were said to have been sacrificed in four days. On and on for days on end, non-stop. Prisoners would be marched up the steps, placed on the altar, their hearts ripped out and shoved into the mouth of a stone god at the altar. Then their bodies were thrown down the steps. Yet, despite all this bloody tyrannical behavior, within the realm there was peace and social and economic reform. You can see why neighboring city-states began to hate the Aztecs. Montezuma died in his 70s. His grandson, Aksayalcatel, became Tlatuani and had the first major defeat. He was died at 32, possibly poisoned by his brother Tizoc, who took over. And Tizoc, in turn, died or possibly was poisoned by a third brother, Ahuizoel. Uh, these three brothers oversaw the doubling of the size of the Aztec Empire. In 1502 came Moctezuma II, the next Tlatuani. Now, he was a strong military leader, but that same year is a year that Columbus discovered Mayans in Central America. Now, the Mayans by that point were probably Aztec vassals, paying tribute to the Aztecs. Fifteen years later, Moctezuma hears a strange report about a white man named Hernan Cortez who came calling. Cortez, the explorer, had left Santiago of Cuba, went over to the Yucatan, eventually making his way to Veracruz. Cortez was looking for fortune and glory, but when he saw the level of human sacrifice, he thought it was his Christian duty to do something about it, to take over. So, in order to have his 500 men follow him, he decides to burn his ships so they would either have to follow him inland and help explore and take over or deal with the natives alone. Cortez would take over by either allying himself with these Aztec enemies or he would do it by any means necessary. And here I have to talk about his interpreter, a native woman named, they called her the Malinche. Now, La Malinche was his interpreter. She spoke Mayan and Nahuatl. And in all the paintings you see of Cortez later on with Moctezuma, you'll see her standing next to him. Mexicans today, for the most part, look at her as a traitor. Now, keep in mind that she was born a princess and that her mother sold her as a child off to slavery. So she wasn't very loyal to, I guess you could say, her slave masters. Now, La Malinche, uh, she became Cortez's lover. They had a little baby boy. You can see them here in this statue, Martin Cortez. Test, a little mestizo. The Pope would later legitimize this little boy. And as for the Malinche, when she became an older woman, well, she lived in an encomienda for the rest of her days in relative comfort. November 1519, Cortez, a Spanish explorer and his small army of 500 men, backed up by thousands of natives, met with Moctezuma. They exchanged gifts and went into the city of Tecnotitlan. Now, Moctezuma was probably getting a feel for his enemy. He gave them gifts of gold, trying to impress them. But this actually fed to their greed. And he probably should have known better. Now, Cortez and Pedro de Alvarado had already conquered other city-states, the Mayans. In the royal palace, Cortes would not allow Moctezuma to leave. He was a prisoner in his own palace, and tensions grew. May 22, 1520, in the great temple, the Aztecs were celebrating a feast when Pedro de Alvarado suddenly leaped on them and massacred men, women, and children. Alvarado said it was to stop a human sacrifice from taking place. The Aztecs, Aztecs said it was to seize their gold. At any rate, the Spaniards blocked the exits, moved in, and slashed away. One account said that among the Aztec musicians, the drummer was stuck with such force that his head flew across the room. Blood ran like water, and the smell of entrails was everywhere. Everywhere. Now the Aztecs were angry, and, it, and the anger and the tension reached fever pitch. Cortez, who was away at the time, came back. News of the massacre reached the far corners. 
The Spaniards thought that the Aztecs would storm the palace. So Cortes asked Moctezuma to step out onto the balcony and try to calm his people down, tell them to cool it. Well, he does so, but the angry mob throws stones at him, hitting him in the leg, arm, and the head. He would go inside, or they would carry him inside, and perhaps from these wounds, he died shortly afterwards. With Moctezuma dead, Cortes decides to escape Tecnochtitlan in the cover of night. So he and his troops try to sneak out, but they were ambushed. Many fall into the surrounding lake and with their heavy armor, drowned. Carriages full of gold, the legendary Cortes gold, sank to the bottom of Lake Texcoco and has never been found since. The Spaniards re refer to this as La Noche Triste, the sad night. Yet Cortes and most of his army did get away. They regrouped and reinforced themselves. The Spaniards came back and took over Tecnochtitlan. Now keep in mind that the Spaniards, unknown to them, also brought a weapon of disease with them, smallpox, which was already devastating the city-states in the north. It would kill 15 million people in five years, 90% of the Aztec population in that region and Tecnochtitlan was already feeling its effect. They had decided on choosing a new leader, Cuitlahuac, but he died of smallpox within 60 days. So they chose another leader, Cuauhtémoc, who was captured by the Spaniards in 1521, became their puppet king. He would become the last Aztec emperor, the last Tlotoani. So a new dawn came up upon this Aztec empire who was no more. Now, I want to stop for a moment to talk about Moctezuma's daughter. Her name was Tequicpoc, but he, she was later known as Doña Isabel de Moctezuma. Now, when she was a child and should have been playing with dolls, uh, Doña Isabel was given in marriage to the Tlatoani of another city-state. When he died and Cortes took over, he passed her on as a wife to Cuitlahuac. But then when he died in 60 days, the new Aztec king became her new husband, Cuauhtémoc. Now keep in mind, she's only about 12 years old at that point. Cortes takes her in. She becomes his lover. She's about 16 years old at the time, and she has a daughter named Leonor. This is not a happy alliance, so Cortes gives her off in marriage to one of his men. Now the daughter, uh, well... Doña Isabel didn't really uh, recognize the daughter, perhaps because she was, well, a sex slave and couldn't see this. But anyway, Cortes provided for her, gave her an encomienda with several slaves. Doña Isabel, well, she would marry two more times, have more children. She'd reconcile with her daughter, Leonor, that when she died, she gave her 20% of her wealth. Doña Leonor married a man who discovered some silver mines and founded the city of Zacateca. And then after that, the Spanish and the future Mexican governments would give royalties to this family. The Aztec Empire was no more. The pyramids are now tourist attractions, and the Spaniards had the natives build Catholic churches all across of what is today Mexico. Of course, the Catholicism of this people is mixed in with what we call pagan influences and folklore. And this is New Spain. Look how huge it is. Later on, well, they would gain their independence, the natives of that area, and they would call this Mexico. And look at how large Mexico was at the time, encompassing a good portion of the United States. And, well, this is the Mexico that we know today. Of course, the Americans have taken over a huge portion of what was before Mexican land. Future Mexican president Benito Juarez had indigenous roots, as did revolutionaries such as Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata. Mexicans continue to celebrate their independence every year. There's over 120 million people living in Mexico today, and they are the seventh largest independent countries. For my next video, we're going to explore and study the Incas in Peru. Now, someone had complained to me that uh, my videos had begun in order. I began with prehistory, went on with the Sumerians, Egyptians, and so forth. And now my videos tend to go all over the place. Well, that is true. However, these civilizations overlap. It's hard to do. Well, what I do want to do is I want to step back and I want to study another video after the Incas with the birth of Christianity. That will come later. But in the meantime, give me your thoughts. Send your comments below or better yet, subscribe. This is Cool Talk.